And hey, um, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you this morning. And um, before maybe some of you guys who are nearer to the mount, before you go and thinking Pastor Todd gained some weight, got an incredible tan and a luscious head of hair. <laughs> I'm not him. Hey, I'm Andrew, the Fredericksburg campus pastor, and it's so good to join you today. Hey, Pastor Todd and I decided to switch places. So he's down at Fredericksburg, and I get to be everywhere this morning. So it's good to join you as we get ready to do the next part in our series called Blind Spot. Hey, before I do that, I just want to say, church, Thank you so much for giving and for praying and supporting us as we have launched the Fredericksburg campus. You know, just a few months ago, right before Easter, we took a launch team of about 80 people and moved into our new building. And this, this a couple Sundays ago, we had to add a second service. And now we're seeing over 300 people come on a Sunday morning down in that space. And not only that, okay... Not only that, but we've also seen 36 Decisions for Christ, 11 baptisms, and a volunteer team of about 100 strong on Sunday morning. So we just praise God for what's happening. And Fredericksburg, you better be clapping down there, okay? So, hey, but uh, I just want to thank you guys again for praying and supporting and giving. And just keep praying that God would do exceedingly more than we can hope or imagine as we minister and turn the light on and show the community that we are for them in Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County. And hey, I'm so excited to bring to you the next part in this series called Blind Spot. You know, over the past few weeks, Pastor Todd has been going through this series and he's been talking about what it means for us to check our blind spot, to see the areas that maybe we've been missing, but also given all these illustrations that reminded us about all these safety checks we're supposed to do when we're drivers of cars, just to make sure we protect ourselves and even those who are around us. And as he's been going through this series, I've been thinking about what it was like when I first started driving. In fact, how many of you guys can remember when you first started to learn how to drive? Raise your hand up. Maybe some of you guys are there right now. Um, Now, how many guys, I want to ask you this at both campuses, now raise your hand up if it was your parents who taught you how to drive. Raise your hand up if it was your parents. Okay. All right. Put your hand down. My parents refused to teach me how to drive. They wouldn't let me drive their car. They They wouldn't teach me. Now, maybe it was because when I was 15 years old, there was a situation where we had a single lane driveway at the house that we were in. And somebody needed to move one of the cars out so somebody else could get out. So I said, Mom, let me move your car. You know, I'm getting ready to start. I'll get my license my, next year, or at least a permit next year. Let me start getting some practice. Nothing's going to happen if I just back a car out of the driveway. Anybody could do it. So I took my parents' 1993 Nissan Maxima, and I backed it out of the driveway, and I hit the telephone pole at the end of the driveway. Now, maybe they, didn't want, maybe they refused to teach me because also when I did actually go and take the written test to get my permits, I actually failed it three times. Now, none of those are reasons or excuses to refuse to teach your children how to drive, okay? But nevertheless, what I had to do to actually get my license is that I had to hire a driving instructor. So as a 16-year-old kid working at Burger King, making $5.15 an hour, I hired a driving instructor to teach me how to drive and to let them, let me use the car so I could learn how to drive. And it was the type of thing where back in 1996, I paid $400 for three lessons to learn how to drive in South Florida. Now, after those three lessons were up, the driving instructor said, you are ready. You are ready to go and get your license. And of course, at that moment, my dad was like, well, I need to make sure that you're ready. So now I do want to actually sit in a car with you and see if you're really ready to go and get your license. So the day came where I sat in the car with my dad, I got into the driver's seat, and my dad got into the passenger seat, and my dad entered that car as a black man, but as soon as I started driving, I don't think he could have been any more white after a few moments. <laughs> man, my dad was screaming like a Jonas Brothers fan. He was fearing for his life as I was driving around in West Palm Beach, Florida. And it's the type of thing where my dad later told me, and you know, the title of today's message is called Check Your Mirrors. And he told me that I needed to check my mirrors because apparently in those early days and when I was driving around with him, I simply didn't check my mirrors. In fact, I can remember during that first year of driving, I actually didn't check my mirrors a lot. In fact, I was backing out of the driveway one day and I hit a telephone pole. And yes, it was the same telephone pole that I hit the year before. 
And there was even one day at school where I didn't check my mirror. I was backing out of a parking space. And I didn't check my rearview mirror and somebody sideswiped the back of my car. Another time I was backing up, I even hit a parked car. So in those early days, there were lots of instances where I did not check my mirrors. And see, when you fail to check your mirrors, disaster can strike. And see, checking your mirrors allows you to see what's behind you. It allows you to see what's coming up beside you. And checking your mirrors can even help you avoid a collision with somebody else. It's checking your mirrors that can actually begin to put you on the offensive when it comes to driving because it can allow you to see who's coming up beside you, but can also help you see who's getting in the right lane for you to get into the right lane so you avoid a collision and you even avoid other people's mistakes. In fact, at both campuses this morning, hey, tell the person sitting next to you, say, hey, good morning, but you need to check your mirrors, okay? Go on and tell them that. Check your mirrors. Make sure you do that on your way home today. You know, each week, we've been reading this anchor verse, these anchor verses out of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. So I thought we would read them out loud again today. So down at Fredericksburg here at Stafford, if you're watching online from somewhere, even if you're at work right now, let's all read this passage out together out loud. So here it is, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Let's read it together. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. You know, the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to this Ephesian church, he faced all sorts of attacks. He faced attacks from inside the church, outside the church, from the government, even being put in jail. He faced attacks attacks being put in jail and also while he was in jail. And I think sometimes when we read these letters that these people inspired by God wrote in the Bible, sometimes we think that maybe they were some sort of saints or they were holy or they were even angels. But the truth of the matter is that even though sometimes God had to send angels to help people who wrote these books in the Bible, that they were not angels, but instead they were regular people who had struggles just like all of us do. And Paul, he had a passion for Christ, but that passion for Christ also brought persecution in his life. And Paul is ending this letter to this church in Ephesians that he helped, in Ephesus, that he helped get started and that he has mentored now for a little bit over 10 years. He's writing this letter to remind this church that God really is strong and mighty power, that he's not impotent, but instead he is omnipotent. He really is all powerful. And he's writing this letter from experience. He wanted this church to know what real faith in Jesus actually did look like. And he wanted us to know how we could really win this spiritual battle that we're all going to face at some point in our life. So how do you win the battle? How do you get through a season where it seems like there might actually be no end and it seems like the enemy is attacking your very life? How do you get through a season like that and still hold on to the mighty power of God, knowing that he is going to lead you through whatever it is that you're going through? So in this passage today, I just want to, I want to show us, I believe Paul shows us three things here that we need to check, that we need to check on, but three tools that he gives us to help us win the battle. So here we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. So if you haven't turned there yet, go to turn there in your Bible or a Bible app or even on the Mount app, and we're going to read these passages together. And so listen to what it says here in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17. It says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand... Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God." 
You know, the first thing I think Paul wants us to kind of check and see if we're doing in our life and a tool that he gives us to be able to win the spiritual battle, the first thing is simply this, is that we need to stand firm. We need to stand firm. You know, when scripture repeats something, when it says something over and over and over again, and when, it, when, when that happens, kind of think of it as almost like there's an alarm going off. Like you need to pay attention to this when something is repeated. And right here in just a few verses, in fact, four times in three verses, Paul reminds the Ephesian church, look, you need to stand. No matter what you're going through, stand firm. In fact, listen to what he says again, just in verses 13 and 14. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that not if, okay, But when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, after you've gone through everything, to still stand. And he says, stand firm. You know, I've been working in full-time ministry now for about 15 years. And one of the things I feel like I see so often, and maybe more often than I should, is that oftentimes when the life of the believer gets difficult or challenging... When you even feel like the attack of the enemy is directly on you and in your life, so many times believers will make the choice to walk away. Or sometimes they'll begin to think, you know what, maybe my faith wasn't valid enough, maybe it wasn't strong enough, or maybe it wasn't even good enough. And maybe that's the reason why God's allowing these things to happen in my life. In fact, sometimes they'll even start to doubt God and start to think, look, if God really did care about me, Why is he allowing me to go through this season that I'm going through? If God really does want the best for me, why was he allowing me to go through this season of despair and turmoil right now in my life? Or sometimes people start to think, you know what, maybe I just wasn't doing it right. Maybe I didn't worship well enough or give enough or pray enough, and now God doesn't care enough about me. And I think what Paul is trying to remind this Ephesian church and what he's trying to remind us today, that it's not a matter of if you will go through seasons like that, but it's a matter of when. So when you do, stand firm. Stand firm on your faith. Don't run away and don't retreat from believing what you believed about God when life was so good. In fact, I really do believe it's in this season when it seems like the world is turned upside down, when you're standing firm on your faith in Christ, that your faith actually becomes even more real to you. You know, many of you guys may know, um, uh, especially here at the Stafford campus, or even those uh, those of you guys back from the Colonial Forge days when we planted a campus there, um, you may know Annie Harris. In fact, she's more commonly known as Miss Annie. In fact, here at the Stafford campus, she's volunteering in our kids' ministry and uh, serves as a greeter as well. In fact, you may see her, I think, typically over by the cafe door here at the Stafford campus. And she's a lady who's wheeling around the oxygen tank, being so nice to people right here on this campus. In fact, I love the fact that with Miss Annie, even though she had an oxygen tank, she didn't let that stop her from serving and volunteering and honoring God on Sunday mornings. Over the past couple of weeks, Miss Annie, however, has, has faced some declining health. In fact, she's been in the hospital over the past couple of weeks. And so uh, lots of pastors have gone to visit her. And so this past Monday, you know, we heard that there was a time where she actually may be going to see Jesus now. But then we heard she was also starting to maybe make a bit of a recovery. And so I went this past Monday to visit with Miss Annie in the hospital. And I was going to go there to do my pastor thing when I go to visit people. I was going to go there and just get an update from her and listen to her. And I believe there was a passage God wanted me to share with her. And I just want to encourage her and then to pray with her and to pray for her. And so I walk into this hospital room and Miss Annie's laying down on this hospital bed. And as soon as I walk in there, she perks up. She perks up and she starts talking about how and she just loves this church. She loves how the people from the church have surrounded her and have been praying for her. Uh, She starts talking about how the messages from this place have just really encouraged her faith. And she starts talking about how Pastor Todd has been such an encouragement to her as he preaches these incredible messages every week. And she looks at me and she says, you know what, Andrew, I tell Pastor Todd this all the time, but I don't think I ever told you that I think you guys are brothers from another mother, okay? 
And she starts to say, you know what, man, your messages have encouraged me too. And I just love your family and seeing your kids grow up. And I heard your adoption story last week. I'm just so grateful that God like brought you into my life. And she's saying all these things. And I say, Miss Annie, calm down. I said, I came here to encourage you, okay? You're not supposed to be encouraging me. And she starts saying, you know, I really want people to see that the joy I have in me is not from me, but it's from Christ. And she told me about how the hospital staff has been asking her, hey, why are you so joyous? Don't you know this could be the end? And she said, I want them to know that that joy comes from Jesus. In fact, she wanted, she wanted people to know, look, I know that I could go to be with Jesus this week. It could even be today. Or he may give me some more time to spend here on earth with my family and my church and my friends. But she said, you know what? If I go to be with him, I'm going to praise him. If he gives me a few more years, I'm going to praise him. I want everyone to know that no matter what, I still trust God and I love him, whether he takes me home right now or whether it's a couple years from now. I was thinking how many people could be in a situation like this where it seems like this could be the end to still say, you know what, I trust God, I believe him, and no matter what happens, I'm still going to praise him. And I thought here is Miss Annie laying down in a hospital bed, but she is standing firm on her faith. And I don't know who this part of the message is for today, but I believe that God wants to remind you today that even though you may be in the middle of a difficult season or even in a season of despair, don't give up, stand firm. If the cancer treatment hasn't been working as well as you would have hoped, don't give up, stand firm in your faith. That prodigal son or daughter that you've been praying for, hoping that they would return, but they still have not come home yet, don't give up on praying for them and seeking God for them and claiming his word for them. Don't give up, but instead stand firm on your faith. And for the college student, stand firm. When that professor or those students tell you that the Bible isn't real, that God isn't real, in fact, the Bible is a book of fairy tales, and we're all actually here from some sort of alien seed, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always commit yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in him is never in vain. When they try to challenge you in the classroom, stand firm because he who began a good work in you, when your parents told you about Jesus, when you were into that high school camp and you not only knew that Jesus was real, but you felt that he was real, stand firm on your faith because he who began a good work in you promises to grow that work and to complete that work until your life on earth here is over. Stand firm because you are not the result of some sort of cosmic accident, but you are instead a divine masterpiece by the God of the universe. So when the day of evil comes, not a matter of if, but when, don't run away from the church, man, don't run away from Christ, but stand firm in your faith. The second thing I think that Paul wants us to kind of check on and, and see if we're using this in our life is not only do we need to stand firm in our faith, but we also simply need to put on. We need to put on the full armor of God. Now, if you missed last week's message, you really need to go back and listen to part two of this series called Blind Spot, because Pastor Todd went through all these pieces of the armor. And because that's where the passage leads today, I'm just going to quickly review them. But you really need to go back and listen to last week's message. But in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17, Paul goes through this armor of God that we need to put on for our defense and for our protection. And he talks about the belt of truth. And how Satan will try to fight us with lies. But as followers of Jesus, we have the word of truth. We also have Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. And how we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And see, the breastplate, it protects the most vulnerable parts of the body, our heart, our major organs, and even our lungs. And see, Satan will oftentimes attack our heart, which is the seat of our emotions, our self-worth, our identity, or even our trust in God. And it's easy to say that we believe, but it can be challenging to obey. 
So when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, this breastplate of right living, and we obey the word of God, no matter in what season, we need to put on the armor of God. And then we need to put on feet fitted with readiness. Now the foot gear that God gives enables us to proclaim the gospel of peace that comes through knowing Christ. And we really do have a message that can indeed stand the test of time. In fact, I love how last week Pastor Todd was up here declaring that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Lord. In fact, I love that Kanye West has been declaring that Jesus is King, that he is King. This is the message that stands the test of time. And I love how we talked about last week that all you need to do is share the gospel and to be ready is to know John 3, 16 and to know your story and you're ready to share the gospel of peace. And then we need to put up, pick up and put on the shield of faith. And holding up the shield of faith blocks against those fiery attacks from the enemy. And it also gets even stronger when you build your life around other believers. And how it's so important to get involved in a life group or serving here at the church and surround yourself with the shield of faith. And then the helmet of salvation. Man, Satan wants us to doubt that God is real. He wants us to doubt that he saved us. He wants us to believe that God really isn't calling us to things in life, that he really isn't doing anything in our lives. But just like how the helmet of salvation can, or the helmet can protect a Roman soldier from a fatal blow, it's the helmet of salvation that reminds us that we really are secure in Christ. And again, you really need to go back and listen to last week's message if you didn't get a chance to listen to it. But I want to ask those of you who did hear last week's message, And those of you who are even familiar with all the pieces of the armor of God, I just have a question for you. Did you put it on last week? Did you armor up? And again, when the Bible repeats something, when when Paul, who's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reminded this church several times about putting on this armor of God, he's trying to let us know, look, this is important. Like, this is for your security, your protection, and your defense. Don't just ignore this. In fact, in verse 11 of chapter 6, Paul says, put on the full armor of God. In verse 13, again, he says, put on the full armor of God. And when we put on the full armor, it's also a reminder, no matter how the fight ultimately ends, man, we have victory in Jesus. In fact, Paul will even go on to say to the Philippian church, look, even if I die, it is still gain because I get to be with Christ. And even if we put on the full armor of God and that fight ends in death, it is still victory because even death has been defeated because of Jesus. So did you put on the armor last week? And God wants us to stand firm in our faith. He wants us to put on the full armor in every single season of our life. But I think the last thing here, and, and last week we missed, we left out one piece of the armor because we want to talk about it today. But the last piece of the armor is so important for all of us because not only do we need to stand firm, put it on, but I believe as followers of Jesus that God wants us to also fight back. To not just be on the defensive, but to go on the offensive. In fact, listen to what verse 17 says in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, take the helmet of salvation. Again, the security that comes in knowing Jesus. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You need the sword of the spirit, the word of God, everywhere and every single day that you're living. You know, all the other pieces of the armor, they really are for for, for defense. They're they're defensive protection for us. But it's with the sword. Not only can you be defensive, but you can also go on the offense. You know, it's interesting here that Paul actually uses um, a word for sword that's not maybe the the, the type of sword that maybe you picture from like Braveheart or like an Excalibur type sword. Uh, The word he uses here in the original language is, is makira. In fact, it may also be translated either machete or dagger. So it's not some type of like big ginormous sword that you can maybe just slash a whole bunch of people with, but it was a smaller sword just like this right here. Now, this is a toy. I was afraid to bring up a real sword here because I thought I might cut myself. (laughs) But it was a smaller sword. It was a smaller sword that the Roman soldiers could keep on them at all times. 
No matter where they are, no matter what, where they were located or what they were going through, they had this smaller dagger type sword, this double edged sword on them at all times. And see, what a sword like this primarily was designed for, it was for hand to hand combat. It was for when the battle was no longer just out there and for everyone else, but instead it was a little bit closer where your very life was being threatened. So it's the type of sword that you're supposed to carry around, not just when the whole battle is raging out there, but now the battles come closer and it's personal. And somebody's even trying to take your own life. It was a type of sword that you could whiff out at any moment and to defend yourself and to fight back against the enemy. I believe what Paul's trying to remind the church here is that the word of God is not outdated. It is not antiquated, but it is living and active. And this is how we fight back when the day of evil comes and when the enemy tries to wage war against our life. And it's not just happening out there, but it is personal and it is up close. You know, earlier this week, I, I heard an interview um, from this guy named um, Kerry Newhoff, and he was interviewing the president of Hobby Lobby. Now, for all you men out there who maybe don't know what Hobby Lobby is or you've never been in one, here's a picture of a Hobby Lobby so you can see what it looks like for you men out there, um, and especially if you've never been in one. And just so you know, if you're a single guy, you're about to take a girl out on a date, man, don't take them for dinner in a movie. Everybody does that. But instead, take them for dinner, take them to a Hobby Lobby, find a project to do, and I guarantee you sparks will fly and you're welcome, okay? <laughs> But so Hobby Lobby in this interview, I mean, Hobby Lobby is a, a big company and they have over 20,000 employees. They'll do about $10 billion in sales um, every single year in revenue. And, and just last year alone, or just this year, in a, in a market where so many retail brick and mortar stores are retreating, Hobby Lobby is actually advancing. In fact, they'll have about 900 stores by the time this year is over. And by next year, they're going to have close to, or I think a little bit over 1,000 stores all around the U.S., they built the Bible Museum um, up in D.C. As a, as a testimony to God's word, spent $500 million building the Bible Museum up there. And they also give away not 1% like most, most corporations do. They give away not 1% or 3% or even 5%. They give away 50% of their profits just back out into the community to help people and to help other organizations. And in fact, even with their employees, they don't start them at minimum wage. They start them at two or three times the minimum wage, no matter what position in the store they're coming into. And so this interviewer, Kerry Newoff, asked Steve Green, the president of Hobby Lobby, he said, how do you avoid all the temptation? How do you avoid the, the same temptation that all these other presidents of companies and CEOs face? I mean, you're a multimillionaire with a very large company. How do you avoid the temptation not to make it all about yourself, to be greedy, or even just to take more for just you? And you want to know what the number one discipline is that Steve Green said that he puts into practice to avoid all of that temptation? He says daily he spends time and he pulls out the word of God. He pulls out the sword of the spirit because he does face attacks every single day. And he wants people to know that a long time ago, even before he was a multimillionaire, he made the commitment that at minimum, no matter where he was, no matter what season of life he was in, that he was going to spend at minimum five minutes learning and practicing and knowing the word of God. Five minutes a day to fight against all the temptation that comes with having all that money. Five minutes a day to fight against the temptation of running this large company, but instead making it all about you. And I thought about what a great challenge for us just to spend a minimum of even five minutes a day learning the word of God and practicing with the sword of the spirit. And I heard this interview and I started to think about how all Steve Green is doing is the same thing that Jesus was doing when he faced temptation himself. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1, Satan himself, the day of evil, came literally to the Son of God. And Satan himself was tempting Jesus. And we're going to read through this, but look what Jesus does every single time the enemy attacks him 
and tempts him. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. How many of you guys know that oftentimes the enemy will seek to attack you when you're feeling weak, when you're hungry, maybe even when you have your guard down? So the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, questioning his identity, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, and he fights back with Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And he said, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple and says, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And this time Jesus fights back with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. And he says, it is, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then it says, again, the devil took him. Now, I know what some of you guys are maybe even thinking or saying this morning. Because maybe you're in a season right now of turmoil, difficulty, or even despair. Maybe you feel like the enemy is attacking your life right now. You might even say, look, I've tried this. I've done this before. But yet it doesn't seem to be doing anything in my life. I want you to know that even right here in this passage, three times, Satan attempts, Satan, Satan tempts Jesus and tries to get him to fail. But every time, he fights back with the word of God. I just want to challenge you that if you're there right now, again, don't give up, but fight back. Because the enemy will come after you again and again and again. So will you stand firm? Will you be ready? And will, can you fight back? And so verse 10, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. See, Jesus used what was written and empowered by the Holy Spirit to defeat his enemy. And see, what the word of God is, what the sword of the spirit is, it isn't just some cute words. It isn't just a list of some motivational thoughts for us. But it is real power produced by the spirit of God that can indeed produce breakthrough in your life. And I really want you to know that maybe you're not experiencing this right now, but there's something about when you actually decide to put this into practice in your life, that you can actually see the difference begin to be made when you fight back with the sword of the spirit. You know, this is something that my wife and I, we've tried to do in our, our own home when we feel like we're under attack. We want to fight back with the word of God, with the sword of the spirit. And one of my, my oldest daughter, her name is Micaiah, and she went through this season where she was so fearful, so gripped by fear. In fact, we felt like the enemy was just attacking her with fear. In fact, she was so fearful, it seemed like almost of everything. We would play a VeggieTales movie, and she would go running away from the TV in the other room, scared about what Larry the Cucumber was doing in this VeggieTales movie. But the one thing that she was probably the most terrified of is that she was terrified of dogs. It didn't matter if it was a big dog, small dog, a quiet dog, or a loud dog. Any mention of a dog or any sight of a dog, she would become so gripped by fear, she would become so panicked and start just crying, asking Jesus to take her now. And there was one night where we were getting ready to put her to bed and, and off in the distance. I know it was off in the distance because there weren't any of our neighbors that had a dog around. So this must have been at least a few blocks over from where we were living. But off in the distance, you can hear one dog howling or barking at the moon or whatever it was doing. And you just hear like a, arr, 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 way off in the distance. And so my daughter hears this dog howling or bark, barking off in the distance, and she just becomes so gripped by fear. 
She just starts crying and just weeping, and she was so panicked, and she just starts saying, Daddy, the, the, this dog is going to come and get me, and it's going to come in here, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to bite my feet off, and it's going to bite my toes off, and she's just crying and weeping, and I, and I said to her, I said, I said, Micaiah, look, if that dog does come in here, it's not going to bite your toes off. It's going to go straight for your face, so you don't have anything to worry about. That's, I did not say that, okay? I did, did not say that. But I kept trying to tell her with everything that was in me that this is a safe place. Nothing is going to happen to you. That dog is so far away. And I said, by some chance, if it didn't make its way over here, find where you are, somehow kick down our door, make it upstairs to your room, then kick down your door, daddy's not going to let anything happen to you. In fact, I'm going to punt that dog in Jesus' name back to wherever it came from. Nothing is going to happen to you. But every time I tried to use my word, she just kept crying. I was just even more and more, faith, more and more fearful. I can remember thinking in that moment as a dad, I almost felt like a failure. I felt like a failure because my words were not good enough to help my daughter. But it's also in that moment, it's almost like I felt God tell me, look, you've tried your words. But now it's time to fight back with mine. And there was a verse that I learned a few years ago after giving my life to Christ in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, where it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I wanted to teach her this verse. I wanted to teach her to fight back with the sword of the spirit. And so she's just about three at this time, so she couldn't read yet. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to put this verse in song form. I'm going to teach her to sing this verse so anytime she's fearful, she can fight back with the Word of God. So I taught her 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And you know what, I'm going to teach it to you today, church. I'm going to teach you to sing this song, to sing this verse. So over at Fredericksburg, I want you to stand up. Here at Stafford, I want you to stand up. Um, you're watching online, I want you to stand up. I feel the spirit of a worship leader coming over me right now. Now, I feel the spirit of Andy LaValle taking over me, and I'm going to lead you in this song right now, okay? So I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you how to sing it first, and then at both campuses, I want us all to sing it together, okay? So here's how the song goes. It goes, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. And then you're supposed to get real big at this part, okay? But power and of love and of a sound mind. Then get quiet again and say the reference because you want to remember what the reference is. Second Timothy 1, 7. Are you guys ready? Okay, you ready? <laughs> Fredericksburg, you ready? Here we go. Remember, quiet in the beginning, okay? For God is... I don't think you guys are being serious this morning. <laughs> Look, we're about to tap into the mighty power of God. We're about to take the sword of the Spirit and fight back against the fear that the enemy would try to put in our lives, okay? So you need to declare this. You need to feel it down in your heart. You put on the armor of God. We're standing firm and we're about to fight back, okay? So here we go. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. Now get real big. But a power of love and of a sound mind. Now quiet again. Second Timothy 1, 7. Now guys, give yourselves a round of applause. You may be seated. You can be seated. You know, there was another time when, like, I don't know what it was this time, but our daughter was again so fearful. She was crying in her room about something that was going on. And I just told her, I said, Makai, you just have to keep singing that verse and praying that verse and it's fighting back with the word of God. And so we left and we had one of those monitors in, the, in our room so we could listen to her. And I remember hearing her through tears, through tears, just saying, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Second Timothy 1, 7. And I just want you to know, church, I think some of you today, fear has been holding on to you and has gripped your life for too long. I believe God wants to tell you today that it's time to fight back. That God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There's some of you today where for too long, and the enemy has gotten you to question 
your identity and who you are. But man, God wants you to fight back. He wants you to fight back with the words of David in Psalm 139, which says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, God's thoughts about you are so much they can't even be counted. And for some of you today, anxiety and worry has tried to destroy your life. I mean, God wants you to fight back today. Just like what Paul would tell the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, that you do not let to have, you don't, you don't have to let anxiety have its way. But instead, with prayer and request and thanksgiving, make those requests known to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and it will guard your mind. Church, we need to stand firm in our faith. We need to be able to put on the full armor of God. But God also wants to take up the sword of the Spirit. He wants us to declare it. He wants us to believe it. Because it's not a matter of if, that season of turmoil or difficulty or even the day of evil will come. But it's a matter of when. And when it comes, he wants you to fight back. I'm going to ask our worship team and Both campuses are going to make their way back up to the stage. And as they're making their way back up to the stage, I really do believe that there's even some people who are sitting over here at Stafford, at Fredericksburg, and even watching online today. And maybe for the longest time, the enemy has been trying to tell you and has been attacking you and saying that, you know what? God can never love you. You can never have a relationship with him. You've done too many bad things. There's no way in the world he would ever want you There's no way in the world he would ever love you. And I'm here to fight back against that today on your behalf and say, just like what John would write in John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world, for God so loved you, that whomever believes in him will not perish, but they'll have everlasting life. I'm here to tell you today that no matter who you are, No matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, like Paul would write in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, that everyone, no matter who you are, that calls on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And maybe that's you today, and maybe you're ready to give your life to Christ. I want you to go to this, bow your heads and close your eyes this morning at both campuses just for a minute. If that's you and you're ready to give your life to Christ, right where you are, would you just pray this simple prayer? Would you say, Jesus, today, God, I want to fight back. Today, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my past. Today, Jesus, I stand firm on you being Lord. And if that's you, while everyone says their heads down, their eyes closed, that's you at either campus. If you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up and just leave it up just for a few minutes so our prayer team can get to you. If that's you, they lift it up high so they can see you and so they can bring you a gift today for accepting Jesus as the Lord and leader of your life. And then while everyone says their heads down, their eyes closed, man, I really do believe that there's people who are here today who you're right in the middle of a battle. And I just want to take a moment and pray for you. Father God, I just want to thank you, God, for everyone here today. And I just want to pray, God, that those right now who are in the middle of the battle, God, that you help them to to stand firm in their faith. God, help them not to run away. God, help them to not to reject what they believed so well when things were good. But help them to stand firm. God, help them to put on the full armor of God. But help them to fight back with the word of God. And church, uh, go ahead and look up at me. And, you know, I, I don't think there's a better way that we could actually end this service today, by, but instead going into a time of communion. So over at the Fredericksburg campus, Pastor Todd's gonna lead you in that time. We're gonna go ahead and turn it over to you guys over at Fredericksburg for Pastor Todd to leave you at that time. And here at Stafford, we're gonna move into a time of receiving communion together. So our ushers and our deacons are gonna come by, they're gonna bring you the elements and we're gonna sing just a song. And then after everyone has been served, then we're all gonna take communion together. So let's go ahead and pass out the elements now.